In um, this video uh, and the following one, we will look at phase transitions. Um, and I tried to find a piece of art that involves a phase transition. I couldn't find any such art. Uh, but I found, uh, of course, um, Jesus converting uh, wine into water, which is not so much a phase transition as, a, as an impossibility. Um, but that's as close as I can possibly get um, for, for phase transitions. Now, um, this particular subject we're going to talk about mainly in a qualitative fashion. Um, and the reason is because um, it's actually quite complicated and involves um, very simple stuff. It involves just asking for water. What happens when you cool it under pressure and heat it under pressure? Um, and it sounds completely trivial, uh, but uh, in fact it isn't. And that's why we're going to do a descriptive version of it with a few calculations, but not very much. So, um, you're taught at school, of course, that uh, there are three states of matter. There's solid, liquids, and gases. And you're told about how, you know, solids have sometimes have crystal in order. Um, and, uh, you know, liquids don't. Uh, and gases have a lot of space between the molecules and will fill the container. Um, but um, we will go into a bit more description here of that kind of thing. Now, that sounds very simple. There's solid, liquid, and gas. That's it. Okay. Uh, but... Nature isn't like that, and so I'm going to give you a little quote from the famous scientist biologist uh, from the early part of last century, J.B.S. Haldane, who said, My own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. And if you look hard enough at things, what you find is the universe around us is just really weird, and things don't behave as, as you might expect. Even quite simple things don't behave as you might expect. So, um, as an example, let's take water. Now, you know, water is, you know, you can have liquid water, and water vapor, and ice. You can have three different phases of water. But in fact, if you look at the phase drawing, this is the phase drawing of pressure here versus temperature um, uh, for ice. And this is probably out of date by now, but there are at least 16 different phases of ice, depending on how the water molecules are arranged. You know, there's ice 2 and ice, ice 8. Uh, and they all depend upon you know what the crystal and nature of the, of the ice is. At a given temperature and pressure, there is one normally one particular one which is the lowest free energy, and that's the one which will be adopted. Okay, but even ice, something as supposedly simple as water, is really complicated. Undergoes all kinds of phase transitions, uh, which you you know you, you know give you a brain hemorrhage just trying to think about them. Okay, so let's look at the PVT surface for two substances. Um, Carbon dioxide on the left here and water on the right. Okay, and um, you know from what we've talked about before that if something is in equilibrium, you it must lie on a PVT surface. It lies somewhere on that surface. There's a surface of equilibrium. Okay, uh, and uh, this you can take about you can think about these as for a fixed amount of uh, of stuff, one one mole of each or something. Okay, but you must lie. On, on this surface here. There's a surface here, which, you know, I'll, I'll draw a point on the surface like this. Up here, it's been cut off. So up here, the surface has been cut off. It's just been, you know, um, and down here, of course, as well, it's cut off, okay? But over here, if you're here or here, you're on that surface somewhere if you're in equilibrium. You can't lie, for instance, up here somewhere, up out of the plane. It doesn't make any sense, okay? You're not in equilibrium there, and it wouldn't. there's not a point on the surface, okay? You're not... That's not an equilibrium uh, value for, for that particular system. So you see here we've got CO2 and H2O, and they're sort of similar looking, except the slope of this particular solid-liquid coexistence is different in, 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 in the two cases. Um, but more or less, they're very, very similar. Okay. So, um, and uh, the lines on the surface are lines of constant temperature. So here's a, here's a constant temperature. This is temperature, and this line here is a line of constant temperature. So I'm going down here, I'm going I'm going at constant T. Here I'm going at constant T. Okay, that's the constant temperature lines. All right. Now, if you look at a surface like CO2, or you look at water, it doesn't really matter, um, you will find regions where we only have one phase. For instance, here at uh, high temperature, we're at high temperature uh, and uh, moderate pressure over here. But if we're at high enough temperature anyway, um, Basically, we only have one phase, which is the vapor. This is this line, okay? And you know for that line, at least for an approximation, at least, if you don't go to too high pressures, too high densities, 
that PV is equal to uh, NKT for that sort of system. Um, as long as we don't make the volume too small or the pressure too high, that's that applies. So this, you know, that's that's that thing there. And you know, here we have uh, more vapor here, but here we have a liquid. Of course, you try and compress a liquid, the pressure goes up enormously. So you're trying to make the compress, change the volume, the pressure goes sky high. So that's why that looks like that. Over here we have a solid. So we have regions where you have gas or liquid or solid. Okay, um, and uh, but other regions. Uh, which I will mark like so, okay, where you will have um, two kinds of substance, two kinds of phases in coexistence. For instance, in this region here, you have liquid and vapor coexisting, okay? If you look at the container of the stuff, you will see some parts of it are liquid and some parts of it are vapor, because the vapor part's too good to see, but um, that's, that's what's happening. And here, you will find in that part of the phase door and that part of the surface, you will find solid and vapor coexisting. And here, you will find solid and liquid coexisting with each other. Okay? It's not one phase, it's actually two phases together. Okay? But the thing to emphasize is to be in equilibrium, it must be at some point on this surface. Okay? It's like there or there. Okay? All right. So you can take slices, and sometimes you see slices of this surface because the surface itself is is difficult to uh, imagine. Um, so you can here have a slice at constant volume. Okay, so at constant volume, if you've got low temperatures, high pressures, you've got a solid. Low temperatures, low pressures, you've got a gas, and then maybe up here in the intermediate state, you have a liquid, okay? Um, separated by these, these lines here, except this line here ends at a critical point, and we will discuss that in a little while. You can also take uh, a, a uh, lines at constant, a uh, diagram at constant temperature, okay, and vary uh, the amount of volume you have in this system. And as you know, basically vary the, compress the thing, so it's going down like that, compressing it. Um, and you know, if you compress the, if you're above uh, above a critical pressure, you're just going to get um, get a gas phase. But if you lower it enough, you can get solid phases down here, for instance, okay. Um, and you can get solid liquid phases and things. Okay, so that's that's their slices of this surface. Okay, next bit. Now, um, coexistence implies a ruled surface. What do I mean by a ruled surface? A ruled surface is one where you can actually put a straight edge, a ruler, on it. Okay, so examples of a ruled surface would be a plane or a cone. Cone's a ruled surface, so you know, here's my cone, and you, there, there's at least one, every every point in the surface has a, at least one direction where you can put a ruler and it's straight, okay? A cylinder is also a ruled surface, okay? So I can, if for a cylinder, I can put my ruler parallel here, and it will be a ruled surface. So if I try, of course, if I try and put my ruler perpendicular on the surface, I can't do it, but that doesn't matter. I just need one direction, one, one direction for each point, and it's a ruled surface, okay? So a coexistence applies a ruled surface, okay? What does that mean? Well, um, in coexisting regions like here, just here, for example, this, this, whole, this whole area, in fact, um, we have the same pressure as we compress the thing. Now, this is the very weird thing about coexistence. I fix the temperature, like, so let's take this, fix the temperature, this, this thing. I compress it a bit, I get some vapor. And then what happens is I get liquid and vapor starting to coexist. And as I compress it, by compression I mean I'm changing the volume, I'm lowering the volume, decreasing the volume. What happens is that the pressure remains constant in this region here. Okay, Along that line, the pressure remains constant. So here I'm, I'm compressing the vapor and the pressure goes up. Here I'm compressing the liquid and it goes sky high. Okay, but along this line here, I'm compressing and the pressure does not go up at all. Okay, so that's a ruled surface because it's, you know, it's, I can draw, I can, I can put my ruler along anywhere in this area and I'll get um, basically, um, I, can, I can do that, it's not curved there. It's curved only in this direction, not in the direction like that. Okay. So... Let's actually go along our surface in a particular way um, for CO2. Okay, I'm going to start it. It's going to do it at constant temperature, so constant T there. 
and I'm going to go A, B, C, D, E, F and see what happens. Okay, A, B, C, D, E, F. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm keeping the temperature constant and I'm gradually decreasing the volume. And look at what happens. It's, you know, it's, it's basically like taking a cylinder, I've got it in a bath, which is temperature T, and I'm gradually just compressing it. I'm putting the piston down and seeing what happens. Okay, that's what that's the experiment we're doing. Okay, yeah, it says, you know, keep T constant, put in a cylinder and compress, just like this, and we're going to look at what we see. Okay, for this particular um, uh, equilibrium surface, which is the one for CO2. Okay, so what do we see? Well, as we go from A to B, which is just there, we get more or less an ideal gas. Certainly it's a gas, um, very close to ideal. And that just has um, PV equals nKT. So the pressure just goes up as nKT on V. So it goes as one on V. It goes up as a sort of hyperbola here. Okay. Now, as we go from B to C, which is just there, let me, let me erase this first. Um, B to C, this is B, and that's C, if you can't see them. Um, I'm going on the ruled surface. I am in the coexistence regime, liquid vapor coexistence. Okay, And what you see when you start compressing the gas here, the, the CO2, which is originally a gas, is you see drops of liquid. So here's my cylinder, which I'm compressing, and you see drops of liquid appearing in the vapor phase. So the rest of it's just vapor, which you can't see. You suddenly see drops of liquid. Okay. And as you compress it more and more and more, um, this way, you get more and more and more liquid. Until eventually, um, you've just got pure liquid. At C, you've got pure liquid. Okay. Now from C to D, what's happening is you're compressing the pure liquid. So in other words, I've just got my cylinder with liquid in it, and I'm just compressing that. And of course, you can imagine that liquids don't compress very easily, and so the pressure goes up dramatically between C and D. Um, then from D to E, as I decrease in the volume, I'm still decreasing the volume, okay? Uh, what happens is you get the same kind of thing as before, except here you've got a liquid and solid crystals appear in the liquid, and the pressure remains constant again. So the pressure is really high, but it remains constant in that region. And then eventually, of course, uh, when you get to, e, uh, to E, you've got only crystals, no, only solid, no liquid. Uh, and uh, as you go to up to F, you're just compressing the solid. You're decreasing the volume of the solid. And of course, the pressure again is crazy. It undergoes some crazy changes. So um, there are two regions here in the liquid vapor coexistence region here and the solid liquid coexistence region there where you get, uh, as you compress it, you get constant pressure. Okay, now that's... That is something which is in completely weird. Okay, you ask most people, even most physics students, if I have a system of uh, liquid and gas uh, in coexistence and I start compressing it, um, how does how does the uh, how does the pressure go? Ninety nine out of you know hundred are going to tell you the pressure goes up. Okay, but it doesn't if you do it at constant temperature. Okay, so that's that's. That's something which, which is weird. People think only quantum mechanics and relativity have weird stuff. No. no everything else has weird stuff in it. Okay? Um, and this, this weird stuff, of course, is something you could have discussed at high school and, and didn't. Okay? Almost certainly. All right. Now, um, some other weird stuff occurs as well. Okay? So, above a certain temperature, which is the critical temperature, we can no longer get gas liquid coexistence. So, you see this region here? It disappears above a critical temperature. So here's the theory of critical temperature, which is about there. Above that critical temperature, you just can't get gas-liquid coexistence. There's no such thing, okay? Um, and that defines a critical point. So there's a critical point there, which is a specific pressure, volume per mole, and temperature on the equilibrium surface. And for um, H2O, this is H2O, this one, um, the pressure is 221 pascals. That's the volume per, per, per mole. Um, and that's the temperature, 647 degrees Kelvin. At the critical point and the vapour, the liquid have the same density and specific entropy. They're basically the same stuff. Okay, so that's the critical point. Now, let's do something crazy. Okay, um, 
let's go from A here to B via two separate paths, all, always equilibrium paths along the, through the, along the surface, around the surface, okay? So one of these paths, we're going to go through the gas liquid coexistence region. So we're going to keep the temperature constant, and we're just going to go compress it, going into gas liquid coexistence, then into liquid. And we get to B, which is supposedly pure liquid, okay? The other one, we actually heat it up a bit, go around the critical point, uh, uh, keeping the, decreasing the volume all the time, and then cool it down a bit and get back to B again. Okay, so this is still liquid. This is definitely vapour. So we've gone from liquid to vapour um, via two different routes, um, and but we've ended up in exactly the same point. We've started there, at liquid and stop there and got pure um, sorry stop started there at vapor got stop there at pure liquid um, and there is no sudden transition here if i go around this thing there's no gas liquid coexistence there's no vapor liquid coexistence there whereas here there is a vapor liquid coexistence and what do we conclude from that well we conclude that there is no quality of difference between a gas and a liquid because even though this one path, I've sort of gone and seen, oh, it's liquid, 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 and gas, and then I've got pure liquid. Here, I've just basically converted a, a liquid to a gas in a continuous fashion, making it more dense. And so that basically tells you what we've said here. There isn't any quality difference between a gas and a liquid. Liquids are more dense, but they don't have any other um, distinguishing features. Okay, And that's not too surprising. Uh, because if you think way, way back to high school, if we go back to our very first slide, okay, back here somewhere, um, this and that are basically just expanded or compressed versions of each other. They're, they're not really any set any different, okay? Um, and as you make the gas more and more dense, you'll find it develops a little bit more short-range structure uh, than it had when it was really, really rarefied. Um, but you can still have a short range structure and be a gas. Uh, and so basically gases and liquids, there is no difference between them in reality. Okay, whereas a gas and a crystalline solid, there is definitely a difference. You know, you, you do have you do have long range crystalline order and in gases and liquids, there is no long range order. Okay, so you, you might have been tempted to ask your teacher in high school, what's the difference between a gas and a liquid? And they would have looked at you and said, you know, you're an idiot. Um, There's an obvious difference, but in fact, um, there isn't much of an obvious difference at all, okay? And for many purposes, they're the same thing in the thermodynamics. The thermodynamic experiments tell you that. Okay, so um, that's, the, that's, the, that's going around the critical point. All right, melting and boiling, okay? Um, just say briefly what this is. This normally occurs at constant uh, pressure, okay? Uh, so you've got this temperature thing here. You might, uh, let's, uh, let's heat the thing up, um, heat the thing up, uh, it starts to melt here, and the melting occurs at constant temperature, right? The melting, you get this liquid and um, and uh, and solid together. Um, and once you've um, got the liquid here, if you go and um, uh, uh, boil it here, okay, it starts to boil. You've got liquid and gas coexisting, and that's a constant pressure thing as well. So you're sort of familiar with some of this stuff previously. And then you keep increasing the temperature, of course, you just got vapour. It was all boiled away. Okay, so um, summarize uh, what uh, what we're going to say here. Water, if you have gas liquid equilibria, water, vapor, and liquid can exist in equilibrium with each other at a given temperature and pressure in some cases. Okay, uh, this implies that the Gibbs free energy A is the same in both phases, and therefore the the chemical potentials are the same. The density and specific entropy differ for each phase. So the derivatives of A, these are the derivatives. These things, density and specific entropy, are the derivatives of of the Gibbs free energy um, and um, make uh, a sudden jump as we go from liquid to gas okay so this should probably have the symbol G rather than um, rather than a okay um, this transition from liquid to gas is thus a first order transition because when you go from a liquid to a gas these um, these things jump okay and uh, the density and specific entropy is going to go sudden jumps. Okay, that's called a first order transition. Okay, second order transitions uh, are a little bit different. They're continuous, and we'll go into this a lot in a lot more detail later on. 
but the second order transitions, the first derivatives are continuous, but the second derivatives are not. And in this case, the order parameter, for instance, um, which is the first, in some sense, this is this is this is the magnetization for a magnetic sample. As I um, go down here, um, at high temperatures you get no magnetization. At lower temperatures, suddenly you get a magnetization, uh, and this magnetization is um, uh, tells you the way it varies. It doesn't vary in discontinuous fashion. It tells you that the um, the system is undergoing a second order transition. This is second order. Okay. Right. So the, the order parameter itself, which is the first derivative in some sense, is continuous, but its second derivative is not. So the order parameter, the, the order parameter is the first derivative, uh, and the derivative of that is discontinuous. And that's true in ferromagnetism, for instance. So if you have an order parameter um, in these kind of systems, something like density, for example, this could be density. Um, if this was density versus temperature, um, in a first order phase transition, it will change discontinuously. In a second order transition, it will not change discontinuously, but its derivative will change discontinuously. So we'll go talk about order parameters much more later on. So um, what do these order parameters look like? Um, well, if I have an order parameter um, versus, it might be density, for example. Here's, here's density as our order parameter. Um, at very at high temperatures, there is only one minima, and that minima is somewhere here, for example. Okay, and that's where the system will sit. It will sit in a, in a, in a low density. Um, this must be well, not density. This must be this must be something like um, one on the density. Okay, because at high temperatures the density is. Um, what is this low temperature? This is low temperature. Sorry, this is low. This is low temperature. So this is density. This is density, uh, and at low temperatures you just get a high density phase. Okay, so at low temperatures. And then as you increase the temperature, you will get um, another minimum occurring at a low density. In this case, it's pretty close to zero. Uh, and then eventually, um, that original minima disappears and you only get the minimum at low density. Okay, so that's what a second order transition, uh, so that's, that's the first order transition, basically, because it undergoes a sudden jump from there to there at a critical temperature, which is Tc here. Okay, so this is the free energy um, versus um, versus density. Okay, that's what happens for a first order transition. In a second order transition, what happens is, um, which is like magnetite magnetism, um, we get a tr a transition as a function of temperature, which looks like this at uh, at low temperatures. Um, or at high temperatures, we might just get one minimum there, okay? And as we lower the temperature, a second minimum develops, okay? But that second minima is infinitely close to the origin, and so the transition from the, this minima to the second one uh, is continuous, and that's a second order transition, it's continuous, okay? And we're gonna do this in much greater detail uh, later on. So um, let's go back to our first order transition, which is this one gas liquid kind of uh, transition here. Okay, so um, at low volume, this is pressure versus volume at constant temperature. We have a pure liquid, which is here. Intermediate volume, we have vapor liquid coexistence, and that vapor liquid coexistence occurs as we vary the volume. If the pressure just remains absolutely constant. Okay, so all liquid. We expand it a bit, we get gas liquid mixture, and we get more and more gas, more and more gas as we expand it more and more. Um, and at large volume, we just get pure gas, and we're out of the coexistent region. Okay. Uh, I note here here that vapor is the same thing as gas. Vapor just means the gas coexisting with the liquid, but there's no difference between the words vapor and gas. They really mean the same thing. Okay. They're the same substance. Okay. Right. So with this vapor liquid coexistence. Um, we have this region here where the pressure is constant, okay? That pressure is called the vapor pressure, okay? And as we increase the volume, all we do is convert more liquid here into gas. That's all we do. But the pressure remains the same. That's the weird thing, okay? And the vapor pressure for a given substance depends only on the temperature, 
okay, not on something else, okay? So if I keep the temperature fixed, I vary the volume here, the vapor pressure, it, it depends only on the temperature, not on not on, on every other thing, okay? So that's that's the weird thing. It's Vapor pressure is the pressure in this system, okay? And you can go look up vapor pressures for water at, you know, various different temperatures. Okay. Right, now we need to look in a bit more detail about what the vapor liquid coexistence actually looks like. Hmm? In the liquid vapor region, suppose we have a volume at the green dot. So here's here's our here's our, our our pressure volume curve, and I'm going to put a volume here, the green dot, which I now I've raised it. So let's do a circle around it. Okay, this green dot. That's where I'm going to try and put some stuff. Okay. The problem is the green dot is not really in equilibrium state at all, despite the fact it's on the equilibrium surface. Because what happens is that it breaks up into a blue bit with that kind of density, and a red bit with that kind of density. And as we compress more and more, we just get more red, a more blue, and less red. Okay? And so that's what happens in this system. You, 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 you can't really put a dot just there. It doesn't really mean anything, because what happens is it breaks up automatically as soon as you do that. So... Um, Let's look again at the PVT surface for water. Uh, it's going to look a bit like this. Um, and, uh, you know, basically it's the same thing as for the carbon dioxide. But um, we let the temperature vary and we get a surface from this from this particular thing. Uh, and nuclear we must mine the surface. We already know this. This is, just, this is just revision. Okay, so it's just a bit complicated. This is another version of that same, same diagram. Okay. Um, and, again, if we're going... Uh, along here and there and there that's equivalent in this slice to going uh, up like this having our compressing the liquid vapor and then going into the, the liquid phase so we're going to go sorry we should go we should be doing this okay we're going along like that in this diagram okay so let's conclude by doing a simple problem in this area okay you can imagine the complications for this kind of surface, uh, sorry, calculations of this kind of surface would be fairly complicated because we need to be able to describe exactly what happens uh, in all these different regions and what happens in the you know liquid vapor and the, and the, and the solid region, the liquid solid vapor coexistence region. In reality, um, we only know at the moment in this in this course at least how to describe the gas phase, you know, and, and even then we say, well, it's just an ideal gas, okay. Um, but we can do still do some calculations, okay? So let's do a simple coexistence problem. Um, so if we were in the coexistence region at constant temperature, we can compress the system without any increase in pressure, okay? However, if we expand or compress too much, we leave this region. So if we start, this is the coexistence region, if we start doing that or going over here, we leave this coexistence region, okay? And the word compress here has a very clear meaning. It means decrease the volume. It doesn't mean increase the pressure. Okay, that's that's the weird thing. Normally, you would say compress something, the pressure almost, you know, you, it implies the pressure actually goes up. Here, it just means that we're decreasing the volume. Okay, so let's do a question. Suppose we have water vapor, only the vapor, no liquid, and no air or anything like that. Okay, at 100 degrees C, at atmospheric pressure, okay, under a piston in a cylinder. The initial volume is five liters. It is then compressed isothermally to 1.6 litres. This must convert the vapour to liquid water, or at least some of it. What mass of liquid water do we create? So we're just going to compress uh, some gas, uh, and we're asking how much liquid water do we have. Okay, and initially we only have uh, the vapour. Okay, let's go across. Answer. Okay. Let M be the number of moles of vapour. Okay, assuming the vapour is an ideal gas, we have PV equals NRT. V is the volume of occupied by the vapour. Initially, this is VI, which is something like 5 litres. Okay. Finally, there's VF, which is 1.6 litres. Okay. Um, and, uh, and to a good approximation, because the liquid water will take up such a small volume compared to the vapour, um, this volume of 1.6 is actually still almost all vapour. Okay. Because the li liquid water is, is, is so dense compared to vapour, but even though we take this system and we compress it down to here, 
it's still going to consist of mainly uh, vapor and hardly any liquid. There'll be some tiny amount of liquid down here. Okay, and we can check later on if that's that's a good approximation. So the number of moles of vapor is initially that. Okay, finally it's that, and the number of moles of liquid water created is just the difference. That's easy. Okay, it's just Ni minus Nf, which is PV P on RT Vi minus Vf. So the mass is W the molecular weight of water is just this. Okay, number of moles times the molecular weight, which is only two grams. Okay, now remember we I claimed that um, the water takes up almost no volume compared to the one point six liters, and we'll just check. Well, two grams of water um, actually is only two cc's, which is two times ten to the minus three liters, which is a hell of a lot less than one point six liters. And so the approximation would be ignore the water uh, to get to get the uh, in all the liquid water to get uh, the volume of the actual gas is a very good one, okay? So um, we will finish that uh, talk here and we'll go on to consider phase 